We have two readings this evening. First of, of our readings will be from Acts chapter 6, a, a passage we have read in our last two services of, as we have considered the, the diaconate here in, in Acts chapter 6, the, the opening seven verses, we see again the foundation, the establishment of this important office in the, the life of the church, an office commissioned by God, ordained by God, commissioned for the good of his church with this crucial work of, of uh, practical and compassionate service. Acts chapter 6, we're going to read the first seven verses. Then after that, we're, we're going to turn to the, the other book that, that Luke wrote, the book that, that bears Luke's name, the Gospel of Luke and chapter 10. And we're going to, to read the passage on, on the Good Samaritan, Christ's parable on the Good Samaritan, or as we'll call it tonight, the Compassionate Samaritan. We'll see how that ties in with, with the deacons in due course. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7, and the parable of the, the, the Compassionate Samaritan, and Luke chapter 10. Luke 6, or sorry, Acts 6, page 1113. Let's hear and, and pay attention to the reading of, of God's Word. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve, that's the twelve apostles, summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it isn't right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit, full of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Then we'll turn back to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 10, and this parable that, that Christ told in, in response to a question of uh, an expert in the law. Luke chapter 10, the parable of the compassionate Samaritan, and we read from verse 25 to 37, page 1057 in the Church Bibles. Page 1057. And behold, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test. That's Jesus. He is putting Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think? proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the, the robbers. He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. We end our reading there at verse 37. 
of Luke 10. And we pray that God will bless this reading of his, his word to our hearts and to our minds. Again, as I said this morning, if you keep your, your finger in both those passages that we looked at a, a little while ago, Acts chapter 6 uh, and Luke chapter 10, we're thinking in our first point, primarily about Acts chapter 6, and then moving on to, to Luke chapter 10 um, later on for, for our second point. It'd be helpful to have both those passages. passages. The first passage, I trust, become familiar to you over the course of, of these past couple of sermons, and then we'll be moving again to a familiar passage of God's word, the, the parable of the, the compassionate Samaritan. So far, you know, in, in our series on the deacons, we've asked, why do we have deacons? And who are we to appoint as deacons? And, and tonight in this, our, our final sermon, before coming to elect deacons, we're going to ask, what do deacons do? What do deacons do? And we've already touched on this in our previous sermons, particularly the first sermon in, in our series. And some of, we, of what we look at tonight, yes, will be a bit of a recap on what we've already looked at, but we're going to, to look at, at some things more closely, some aspects of, of the work more closely. Um, and then we're, we're going to look particularly at the, 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 the compassionate mercy ministry of, of the deacon towards the end of, of our, our address. Um, we, we've seen over the course of our sermons how the, the verb to, to serve, deacon comes from the, the verb to serve, diakoneo, um, and, and God has, has established the, the office of the deacon to serve something that, yes, he calls all his people to. We're all called to, to serve, to be deacons with, with a small d, as I've said. But he's created the, this particular office of deacon with the title of deacon to take a lead and, and oversee the, the, the work of service within the, the church and by the church. And we, we've already seen, particularly in, in our first sermon, we have seen the dual aspect of the, the service that we're called to, the two types of service entrusted to the deacons. Firstly, practical service, uh, and secondly, compassionate service. And it's these two types of service that we're going to look at in particular this evening, looking briefly at the practical service that the deacons are entrusted with, but spending the majority of our time looking at the compassionate service that this office of deacon has been established to undertake and oversee. But firstly, practical service. Two simple headings, practical service and, and compassionate service. Firstly, practical service. We saw in, in Acts chapter 6, the work to which the, these first seven deacons who were ordained in the church of, of Jerusalem, the, the work they were ordained to was that of serving tables. Verse 2 of, of Acts chapter 6, the apostles say to the church, it's not right that, that we should give up the preaching of the word to serve tables. And they appoint seven men for this work that they describe as, as serving tables. And we saw how that word used in this verse uh, uh, tables, it, it is a word that, yes, it's used for meal tables, but it's also used for, for financial tables. Banks is one way of, of translating it. When Jesus cleared the, the temple and the gospels, he overturned the tables of the money changers. The word that the gospel writers use for those tables, the money changers tables, Christ turned over. It is exactly the same word that, that Luke uses here in, in Acts chapter 6, verse 2. It is a word that Luke translates himself, that, that is translated in our English translations in Luke 19, verse 23, as bank. It, it means that financial tables or, or bank. The tables that these first deacons were appointed to serve were in part financial tables. The service that these first deacons, the office of the diaconate was established to undertake was that of overseeing the finances, the, the administration, the practicalities of church life. So what does that practical administration look like in our congregational life? Um, you know, so far removed from the first century church, what does it look like in practice in our church's practical administration that the deacons are, are called to undertake and oversee? Well, it includes, as we, we see here in, in, in Acts chapter 6, it includes looking after the finances ensuring that, that our tithes are banked and, and properly recorded, gift aid is clean where possible, paying all that the church is outgoing, you know, heat and light for the building, oil and, and electricity, rates and, and insurance, paying uh, your minister and the ministry and, and mission targets that are set by our synod, 
making funds available for all the different ministries of, of the church, the friendship group, uh, CY, Footsteps, and, and all the different ministries, overseeing as, as a whole the, the expenditure of the church to ensure we, we don't over, overspend beyond our means and, and what, our spend, what we spend on is wise. But the deacon's practical service goes beyond just finances, managing our finances. It involves overseeing the, the legalities, the legislative practicalities affecting church life, or our health and safety. We have our, our fire exit signs. We have our, our, our fire extinguishers, um, our, 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 our exits in the, in the kitchen. They, they look after fire safety. They, they look after the pop testing of, of our electrics, all our environmental health matters our food hygiene registration of, of our, our trustees that, that is still on, ongoing since the election of new trustees in 2019. But we'll chase up the solicitor not at some stage. It includes the, the repair and, and, and maintenance of, of our buildings, ensuring that we have suitable, you know, clean, safe, comfortable premises in, in which to worship and, and carry out all the different activities of, of the church. It includes, as, as our deacons are, are doing at the minute, navigating the congregation through the, the myriad of, of issues that we face and ensuring that we have safe, practical, suitable buildings for our, our worship services and all our different ministries. And they don't have to do these things themselves. They, they can delegate aspects of, of their work to, to members in the congregation, to, to people or, or groups of people to to, to undertake and do on their behalf and, and our deacons oversee and, and, and manage those that, that they delegate the work to. You know, for example, the bulk of, of our finances isn't done by the deacons as a whole. Keith takes it on as, as our treasurer, does that delegated responsibility from, from the trustees. There's a group of people meet with, with Keith, um, uh, William, Anne, meet on, on, on a basis through the year to, to count our money and, and make sure it's, it's banked properly, recorded properly. Um, we, John and, and William both look after the, the cleaning. It's not a responsibility the deacons take on themselves. John and William do it on our behalf, caretaking, opening and shutting. There's some of the ladies look after the, the, the food hygiene, the environmental health, the kitchens inspections and, and those sorts of things. But all under the overall oversight and, and, and management of, of the deacons, delegated responsibility that the deacons oversee. There's nothing stopping the, the deacons delegating even more work and responsibilities if they choose, while again maintaining oversight, that oversight function, overseeing, managing the, the practical service in the church. But just some aspects of, of the, the practical service in the church that, that our deacons are, are called to undertake, given the task of, of overseeing, practical service. The second type of service that we're going to spend the rest of our time and, and the majority of our time looking at this evening, which is our, the predominant focus of, of the, the deacons, is that of compassionate service. Secondly, we're thinking of compassionate service. The seven original deacons who were ordained in the Jerusalem church in Acts chapter 6 weren't simply entrusted with looking after the finances of, of the congregation in Jerusalem, the practicalities of the congregation in Jerusalem. They were commissioned, as, as we know, as, as we have read a number of times over the course of, of this little series, they were commissioned with the task of overseeing the daily distribution to the, the needy widows in the church, the, the, the widows who had no means of providing for themselves. And this was their, their prime duty, their foremost duty, leading and overseeing the mercy ministry, as are sometimes called, of the church. They were tasked with being the compassionate heart and hands of the church. Compassionate service that all of God's people, without exception, are called to and to be involved in. But deacons, this office of, of the diaconate is established to lead and oversee this compassionate service, mercy ministry of the church that God's people, all of God's people are to be involved in. But what is this compassionate service God calls us to as, as individuals? Is it, is it simply looking after widows who have no means to look after themselves? What does it involve? Why, why are we to do it? What, what's, what's, what's the big deal? Those are, are some of the questions that we're going to spend the remainder of our time looking at as, 
as we think about this compassionate service that we're all called to as individuals and we're called to corporately as a body of God's people. And the deacons in our congregation are entrusted with, with overseeing and leading us in uh, as a corporate body. And we're going to draw our answers. Turn with me now from Acts chapter 6. Turn to Luke 10. We're going to draw our answers from this well-known passage of Scripture, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Or the parable, we're going to call it tonight, the parable of the Compassionate Samaritan, in which Jesus pictures for us this compassionate service that we are all called to. The first thing that, that we see about compassionate service or mercy ministry here in this parable is the condition giving rise to compassion. The condition giving rise to compassion. Compassion, very simply, is a feeling of sorrow. It's a feeling of, of pity. It's a feeling of, of sympathy at someone else's condition. They're experiencing difficulty. They're experiencing deprivation of some kind, and you feel sorry for them. It's, it's as simple as that. You feel sad for them. You feel pity for them. You feel sympathy for them in their difficulty or their, their deprivation. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, and, and Matthew 14, verse 14, Jesus, he saw the crowds. He saw them harassed and helpless. He saw them like sheep without a shepherd. And Matthew tells us he had compassion on them. Mark chapter 8, the crowds were told to have been with Jesus for three days. They had nothing else to eat. They, they were hungry. They were, they were starving. And Mark says he had compassion on them. In Luke chapter 7, Christ comes across a widow. She's a widow woman. Her husband has died. She's following the, the body of her dead son in the funeral cortege. With a word, she's going to place the body of her dead son in the ground. And Luke tells us Jesus had, had compassion on this widow. Seeing the plight of these people, Jesus had, had sorrow, he had sympathy, he had pity for them at the difficulty, the, the deprivation they were in. That's compassion. And here in, in this parable, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus describes a man whose heart is moved in compassion. The Samaritan man, as, as he's journeying along the road, he comes uh, across a man who is lying on the verge of the road, who's, who's been attacked by robbers. He's stripped, we're told. All his, his earthly goods have been stripped away. He's been badly beaten. He's lying battered and bloodied in the ground. He's half dead, close to death. And in verse 33, in contrast to, to the two men, good religious men, a priest and, and a Levite had come, they'd seen the man, and they'd walked on the other side of the road. In contrast to, to these two men, Jesus says the Samaritan, when he saw him, had compassion. When he saw him, he had compassion. He felt sympathy. He felt pity. He felt sorrow. And there are plenty, plenty of situations, plenty of conditions that people are, are in today in our society, in our world, that should move us in compassion. People in the grip of poverty, struggling to, to make ends meet. People caught in, in unemployment, trapped in, in crippling debt. The hungry, the homeless, the helpless, the hard-pressed. People caught in addiction. People who've, who've been abused people caught in a, the spiral of, of anxiety, people who are lonely, people who are vulnerable, people who have been abused, people who, who feel ignored, people who are, who are imprisoned, actually physically imprisoned or imprisoned in, in other ways in, in their mind, in their, in their situations, elderly people with no family to care for them or, or family who simply don't care, choose not to care. <laughs> The disabled who are often pushed to the very fringes of, of our society. People from whom all medical hope is now gone and, and they're receiving end-of-life care. No medical hope is gone. They're receiving end-of-life care. People struggling with their sexuality. People struggling with their gender. People struggling with unwanted pregnancy. Children squeezed into an, an already bursting care system. Refugees 
those are only the ones that, that come to mind quickly whenever you're, you're pressed to, to write down a list of, of things, situations we should have compassion over. In our own town, if we don't physically see people um, in this situation, certainly we hear about people who are caught in the addiction of, to, with drugs, don't we? We see young people left to roam the streets every weekend or congregating to, to drink. Our executive has re recently passed legislation on abortion that will lead to to thousands, thousands of unborn babies being, being aborted each year and a lifetime of, of guilt for many of those women and, and men as well who, who take that option. We're currently in, in, in the grip of a cost of, of living crisis that hasn't been seen and hasn't been witnessed in a generation. You know, petrol, William was saying, petrol last week one day went up three times in, in one day. Oil, gas, food, everything, pushing more and more people, you know, over the line, into debt, into the red. The world, it seems to lurch from, from one refugee crisis to another, doesn't it? It was Syria, it was Afghanistan, it's currently Ukraine. And while the crisis of the moment, as you might like to call it, you know, we have, we have a crisis at the moment that our, that our focus is on, it did quickly uh, melts away and there's another one but as the, the crisis of the moment unfolds and, and grabs the headlines people in the third third world countries continue to starve continue to experience malnutrition starvation lack of health care those are conditions that should produce compassion in us should fill us with sympathy and sorrow and pity and those, those conditions that, that should, should stir compassion in our hearts move us to, to pity and sorrow. They're not, they're not all out there in the world. You don't have to go into the world, either in, into, your, into your community, into our country, in, into the third world, to, to, to meet people who, who deserve, need our compassion. There are people here. People in your families. People here in your church family who, who need compassion. Ill. Lonely, hurting, vulnerable, anxious, grieving, struggling people. And we need eyes to see people's situations and needs and hearts that are soft to the needs and situations of people. Eyes and, and hearts of compassion. And yes, with so much need, it's easy to get calloused hearts, you know, heart, our hearts become hardened to it. Yeah, refugee crisis, after refugee crisis, Syria, Afghanistan, you're Ukraine, and the Ukraine crisis goes on, yeah, and we see more, you know, yeah, the ongoing war, and, and as we hear it in reports, we, we become hardened to it. And the, the news and the reports of the deaths of, of Ukrainians or the refugees leaving, we become hardened to it. Oh, another 200 men dead today, right? Okay. We become hardened to it. We need soft hearts of compassion. Jesus told this parable in response to a question from a lawyer. Who, he, the lawyer said, you say that I'm to love my neighbor? You say I'm to love my neighbor? And this man asked, the, Jesus, he said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? And the answer that Jesus gives him here in this parable, the answer to his question, who is my neighbor? Jesus' answer is, your neighbor is anyone who needs you to be their neighbor. And the question for us tonight, both, both as individuals and, and as a collective, as a congregation, particularly we're thinking of, of deacons, and the question as individuals in a corporate body is, who needs you to be their neighbor? The challenge for all of us our, our, and our deacons as, as overseers of the compassionate ministry of the church is to have eyes open to the needs of the people around us, to see those people who need compassion, need us to be a neighbor, and hearts that are open to those needs. The second thing that we see in, in this parable is not only, we, we don't only see, let me see, I forgot my point. 
the condition that gives rise to compassion. Secondly, we see the conduct that flows from compassion. The conduct that, that flows from compassion. It's not enough to feel this compassion in our hearts. We're told in this parable. We need to do something. In James chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, verses that we, we looked at in our first sermon in the deacons, G, James writes, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, one of you says to him, go in peace, be well fed, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body. James says, what good is that? What good is that? He said, He's saying there, you need to do something. And we see that in Jesus' compassion. His compassion in, in the examples from the Gospels that I mentioned earlier, it, it led him to do something. He taught the crowds. He showed them who he was. He, he showed them how he was the, the one who came to, to, to take off the, the burden of the law from them. He fed the hungry. He healed the sick. He raised the widow's son. Ultimately, his compassion led him to do something. And ultimately, very ultimately, his compassion took him to the cross. And similarly, 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 I don't think I got that right third time, with the Samaritan, he didn't just look at the man bleeding out at his feet and say to himself, oh, this is awful. Oh, this poor man. Oh, his wife's going to be devastated. What about his children? And then sit, sit stand with, it, with a furrowed brow and, and his hand on, on his brow in consternation. He didn't take a quick snap on his phone for a, a nice virtue signaling post on his social media you know, to get a few likes to see how compassionate and, and, and loving he was. Oh, look at this poor man, snap. You know, hop on his donkey and, and ride off. He did something. His compassion turned to, to, to action. He bound the man's wounds. He applied antiseptic and ointment. He put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he continued to care for him and, and, and supplied for, for his continuous care and convalescence. His compassion led to action. Um, and it was costly action. It cost him his time. It cost him his money, two days' wages, just to, to pay a loan for, for the, uh, the inn. And, and he said, if it comes to any more, I'll, I'll pay it. It, it was costly in, in the fact that it, uh, it's, he put himself at considerable risk, you know, lingering in this hot spot, no one hot spot for robbers. It was sacrificial action. He, he was involved in using, giving his own resources for this man's care. But his compassion led to sacrificial, costly action. And it's easy to have compassion in a way. It's easy to have hearts moved at other situations, but that's not enough. Our compassion is to lead to action, action that costs you, that involves you sacrificially helping others from your own resources. That's, that's what this passage is telling us. No, we can't help everyone. There's no way in the world that we as individuals or, or as a corporate body, as little congregation in Ballyclare can meet the needs of everyone. But out of the resources that God has given us, he calls us to costly, sacrificial action, compassionate action to help those in need. And you might be, be sitting there and thinking to yourself, yeah, I see what you say, Nathan, but, but isn't that the government's job? If only you, you saw my wage slip and the amount of tax that come off my, my wages to go into the healthcare system, to go into the pension system, to, to go into to the, the, the social welfare system. You know, the, the, surely the, the government is meeting those needs. It's their job. And I pay into that quite costly and, and sacrificially, I think, uh, out of my wages. And yes, the government does provide a lot of help through the health service and the social care system and, and the welfare system, through our, the foreign aid budget and, and disaster relief. Yes, it does. But it doesn't cover all of the needs of all of the people all of the time. It can't. It's good and it does a lot and we're far from appreciative of what it does in our country. But it is far from perfect. And the existence of, of so many charities, you know, a, a voluntary sector that, that's so big, that is, that is growing and dedicated to meeting all sorts of needs is proof in a way that, that the, the, the government is not, cannot meet all the needs of our society and the wider world. 
There are plenty of needs that we as individual Christians in a church are called to step in and meet, whether in our families, I've mentioned our families already, whether in our church family, our community here in Ballyclare, our, our community, the wider community of Northern Ireland, the UK, and then further afield, right across the world. Plenty of needs that the, the church is, is in a situation and should be in a situation to meet. And in a way, you know, that the huge volume of support that is provided by charities in the voluntary sector, in a way, it should put the church to shame. This is the job of the church. <clears throat> this is the job of the church. It was formerly done so well by the church. Maybe the welfare state, the, the intervention by government has led us to neglect this, you know, we, we've seen the government step in, so we've neglected this, this important duty which we're called to as a church. Maybe an, a, another cause is just the lack of funds from, from God's people to the church to do this work, or the lack of time that God's people are prepared to give to, to support organizations doing this work. We have open eyes to see the need. We have open hearts that are moved by the need. But we're also open hands. To meet that need, providing out of our resources, not just money, not, not just not just money, but providing out of the resources that we have, sacrificially, costly, to meet the needs of others. And as, as I said, it doesn't always need to be financial cost. It shouldn't always be a financial cost. Because sometimes the need is just time. It's just time. It's a conversation. It's a telephone call. It's a, it's a conversation at the door of church, the car park of church. It's a time that otherwise you would give to watching TV to, to, to supporting uh, a church ministry or, or a, a church-based ministry. You know, food bank, the food bank here in town, yeah, it needs money but also needs volunteers. Youth for Christ, yeah, needs money to, to pay its rent, but it also needs volunteers. It's not always money. It's whatever resource you have, God calls us to give it in a costly, sacrificial way. And the challenge for us, again, we're, we're finishing all our points with a challenge. The challenge for us tonight, both as individuals and deacons, is where there's a need. Where there's a need, are we acting on that need? sacrificially and at a cost to ourselves out of the resources that we've been given. And I said again, we, we can't meet every need. And the, the deacons know all about that. L lots of needs come to us, we can't support them all. <clears throat> but where there's a need, out of, you know, where we can. We don't just, just don't support any needs, but where we can, and making those difficult choices, where there's, where there's a need, out of our resources, are we seeking to meet it? at cost, sacrificially. The conduct that flows from compassion. The condition giving rise to compassion, the conduct that flows from compassion. The third thing we see in, the, in this parable of compassionate, about compassionate service is the command to show compassion. The command to show compassion. Having told this parable about the compassionate Samaritan, Jesus ends his interaction with the lawyer. He says to him, and in verse 37, he turns to him and he says, you go and do likewise. You go and do likewise. Now, it doesn't take a theology degree to understand what Jesus is saying here. He is commanding us. He's saying here in those words, he's saying, be a neighbor to those who need you to be a neighbor. He's saying, have the open eyes, have the open heart, have the open hand, the open, the open wallet of the Samaritan. He says, go and do likewise. This is what I want you to do. And this isn't the, this isn't the first, and it's certainly not the last time that this command is given in Scripture. Again, we, we've seen this. We saw this in, in I think it was our, our first sermon in the series of, on, on deacons. There are numerous passages where God commands us, both as individuals and as a corporate body, his church, to, to this, this compassionate service. Deuteronomy 15, I, I mentioned this before, 
verse 7 to 11, God told his people is in the Old Testament, if one of your brothers should become poor, you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. James chapter 1, verse 27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep one, oneself unstained from the world. Colossians 3, verse 12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts. Galatians 6, verse 10, I mentioned this already. As we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are in the household of faith. John 13, remember the, the night before he, he was betrayed, the night before he went to the cross, Jesus, the son of God, stripped off his, his, his outer garments, put on a, 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 a towel around his waist, got down on his knees to clean the dirty feet of his, of his 12 disciples. And in, in verse 14 of John 13, he said, if I have washed your feet, you also ought to wash the feet of one another. He said, I have given you an example of how you're to act, you also ought to serve one another. Command after command after command, here in, in this parable, in this command, that, that he gives, the, the command that Jesus gives us at the close of this parable, go and do likewise, he is simply repeating and reiterating a command that is found right throughout Scripture. He says, serve. And serve as this man served. Go and do likewise. And just think about how the Samaritan served. He was a Samaritan. And he came across a Jew. A bit like an ardent Republican coming across a member of the UDA lying battered and bruised on the side of the road. The, the Jews were the Samaritans' enemies. He comes across an enemy. He wasn't only a stranger to the Samaritan, he was an enemy. And at his service, it, was, it wasn't only for an enemy, it was costly. He used his own time. He used his own money, his own resources. His service was done at, at great risk to himself. He put himself in harm's way. It was sacrificial. It was gracious. This man hadn't done anything to, to deserve it. It wasn't miserly. You know, he, he didn't negotiate with the innkeeper. You know, yeah, I'm doing this out of, out, of my, out of my own pocket. You wouldn't knock, knock off a few pound off the bill. It wasn't miserly. It was fulsome. It was given without reserve. And Jesus says just at the end of this parable, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. And we end the point with a challenge challenge for us tonight as individuals and as deacons is are we are we doing likewise are we obeying this this command that, that christ has has given us to compassionate servants the condition giving rise to, to compassion the conduct that flows from compassion the command to, to show compassion. The final thing we, we see here in this parable of, of the compassionate Samaritan is the catalyst to show compassion. The catalyst to show, compar to, to, to show compassion. And we've been singing about this catalyst right throughout our, our service this morning and our service this evening. Our catalyst is Jesus. Jesus. I've already mentioned the events in John 13, where the night before he died, knowing he was going to the cross, as his disciples sat around the table in, in the upper room ready to eat, Jesus got up and he took off his garments, his outer garment, he took a towel, he wrapped it around his waist, and he got down on his knees to wash the, the dusty, dirty feet, get among the the, the toes of, of his disciples' dirty feet. And after doing so, he, he rose in verses 14 and 15. He said, if, if I have washed your feet, if I have done this for you, you also ought to wash one another's feet. You also should do just as I have done to you. You also should do just as I have done to you. 
He laid down a principle that should be the catalyst for our compassionate service. He says, in light of everything that I have done for you, in light of my service for you, you should be people of compassionate service. His compassionate service. Coming into this world. God coming into this world as a man. Dying on the cross. Taking the punishment for our sins. So that, that we might be forgiven. So that we might have the hope of, of eternal life. Reunited with God. Relationship with God restored. And having the hope of eternal life with him in heaven for eternity. His compassionate service. What we have, what we are, because of his compassionate service, it should compel you to serve others. And we have in this parable of the compassionate Samaritan, we have in this Samaritan a beautiful picture of Jesus and his compassionate service. This Samaritan comes across a man who is an enemy. And he's bleeding out. He's dying before his, his very eyes. He's at the verge of death. He's unable to help himself, having been stripped of, of all and, and every means he has of helping himself. He's completely hopeless, completely helpless, completely dependent on others if he's to live. And the Samaritan, without compulsion, without being compelled to, without being forced to, and at great personal risk, sacrificed himself and cost to himself. In an act of amazing grace, he gets down on his knees. And he bandages his wounds. He puts ointment and antiseptic on his cuts and on his bruises. He puts him in his own, his, his own donkey. He puts him in his own car. He takes him to the inn where he continues to care for him and then pays for him for his continued convalescence. He provides for all his future care. Isn't that a beautiful picture of Jesus? Beautiful picture of Jesus. Who, although we are enemies, you know, we're, we're the Jew in this picture. Who, although we are enemies, and we're lying dead on the ground, unable to help ourselves, bloodied and bruised and helpless, without the means to help ourselves, Jesus comes along and he picks us up. He cares for us. He binds, as, as the psalmist says, he binds our, our broken heart. He binds our wounds. He bore the punishment in himself that we might be forgiven. And he'll, in time, he is at this very moment carrying us to the inn, as it were, where he'll care for us and provide for all our future needs. We have in the Samaritan a beautiful picture of Jesus. As Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, speaking about Jesus, he says, Though he was rich, yet for your sake he, become, he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. The overwhelming, abundant compassion of Jesus. What you have because of his compassion, that the people that you are today, what we are today because of his compassion, should compel us to be our catalyst to show this compassion that he calls us to show, to go and do likewise, to show to others the compassion that we have been shown in such an amazing abundance. In 1 John 3, verse 17, John writes, If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? He says, If you have the world's goods, you see somebody with nothing, and you close your heart to that person, how in the world? Does God's love abide in him? 
in you, in me. If you claim to be a Christian, John says, and you're not showing compassion, he says, how can you claim to have received and joy the compassion of Jesus? He says, either you haven't received it or you don't appreciate it. If you've received it, appreciate it. And appreciating it, appreciating it, show it. That's, that's what John's saying. And again, closing, the question for us, the challenge for us tonight as individuals and as deacons is have you received the compassion of Jesus? Having received Jesus' overwhelming, gracious love, his amazing grace, as the hymn writer put it, having received his amazing grace, do you appreciate it? Are you showing it in your family, in your church, your church family, to your neighbors, to your community, in your country, in the wider world? That's compassionate service. That's what Christ calls us to in Luke chapter 10. It's a work that God, in, in his wisdom and in his grace, has commissioned the, the deacons to, to undertake and oversee the compassion ministry to those within our, our church, our church body, our church family, and wider afield. May God give us open eyes, open hearts, and open hands, in obedience to his call, and in willing service to the one he has shown such amazing compassion to us. Amen. Thank you.